Highland Membrane Disease, or HMD. As you all know, RDS is a major cause of both morbidity and mortality in the NICU, and it's something that we deal with pretty much every single day in the NICU, so it really is very important that you understand this whole concept. So today we're going to go through what causes RDS, the symptoms of RDS, the chest x-ray findings that you'd see with RDS, and then also the treatment. So let's talk about the causes. I know I've become a stopped record with this, but like all three-letter acronyms, the smaller the baby, the younger the baby, then the higher the frequency and the worse the severity of RDS, just like pretty much everything else in the NICU. And the reason for that is what causes RDS is the immaturity of the lungs. So there's immaturity of the lungs themselves, and if you think about it, the lungs are still really, really growing and developing in utero and even after birth. In fact, the saccular stage, which produces the respiratory bronchioles, which are really the first surface that can tolerate gas exchange, do not develop until about 24 weeks, which is why babies younger than 24 weeks are really not very good at surviving. The alveolar stage doesn't develop until 32 weeks, so really in that like late second trimester period, babies are pretty much breathing through the respiratory bronchioles. The surfactant production does start at 20 weeks and it's produced by different cells within the respiratory system. Eventually it's the alveolar cells, but it starts at 20 weeks, but not with a very high level of production. The level of surfactant production until term is really very, very low. And more importantly than that, the way that the surfactant is recycled is also very inefficient. Whereas in term kids and, and older people and adults, surfactant is constantly being recycled. So really there are two causes. The first one is obviously just immaturity of the lungs. If you've got less cells that are capable of gas exchange, then obviously a baby is going to have difficulties breathing. The second reason is the surfactant efficiency. So why is surfactant important? Surfactant is mostly a phospholipid, so it's a very fatty substance with about 10% of proteins. And its job is very much like a detergent. So when you have a bunch of fluid molecules covering an area, so if you have a bunch of water molecules covering an area, those water molecules are attracted to each other and form bonds between each other, so thus creating surface tension. So the higher the attraction between those water molecules, the higher the surface tension. And you can imagine that the surface tension inside a little ball of cells is going to pull the sides of the ball towards each other and create collapse. So the higher the surface tension, the higher the intrinsic pressure is needed to keep those cells open or to keep the alveoli open. What the surfactant does is it's basically like a detergent, just when you're like washing dishes and you pour in some dishwasher detergent. It breaks up all those water molecules, so it breaks down the surface tension. Therefore, the pressure that is needed to keep that ball of alveoli cells open is much, much lower. So what you're then hoping is that those areas of the alveoli are not going to collapse because the pressure that is being delivered is enough to keep them open. So ultimately, we need surfactant to break up the surface tension within the alveoli so that less pressure is needed to keep them open. So let's go over the symptoms. I'm sure you've all seen this before, but if a baby does have the immature lungs or lacking surfactant, then pretty much as soon as the baby is born, the baby is going to be in respiratory distress. This is slightly different from TTN, which can worsen over the first few hours of life. With RDS, pretty much as soon as they're born, they're going to have difficulties breathing. Their lungs could be completely collapsed, or they could just have a lot of increased work of breathing as they're desperately trying to get the pressure in to try to expand their lungs or make up for that missing surfactant. So you could have completely no respiratory effort if the lungs are completely collapsed and the baby literally doesn't have the effort to open them, or you could have the increased work of breathing, which is things like the retractions, when you have the subcostal retractions, the retrosternal retractions, the suprasternal retractions, where you're just seeing the skin get sucked in and out behind or um, underneath the ribs. You could also have the grunting, so that's when you hear this noise, the uh, uh, 
So the baby is trying to stent open the lungs by increasing that pressure right at the end of expiration to try to prevent further atelectasis. That can also be a marker that there is surfactant missing. The baby could be tachypnic, so just breathing really, really quickly because the baby isn't breathing deeply enough, so it's trying to get rid of its CO2 by breathing faster. Eventually, if the baby is really in trouble, then the baby will have desaturation. So the oxygen saturations will go down as the 80s or 70s or even worse than that. So any signs of increased worker breathing are all going to be very consistent with RDS. So how do you prevent RDS? Like I've said a million times before, you prevent it by preventing preterm births, which we're not very good at. But the most helpful thing that can happen before birth is that the mother is given the prenatal steroids. So the prenatal steroids that the mother is given, the betamethasone shots, um, 24 hours before delivery hopefully, and at least 48 hours before delivery, decreases the rate of both of the severity and the frequency of the RDS, as well as, like we already said, IVH. So it's very, very helpful when those mothers get steroids right before delivery. So preventing preterm birth and giving steroids to the mother. There's a lot of conversation about babies that are more stressed generally have slightly better lungs. And there is some truth to that. If the mother was having high blood pressures during delivery or during pregnancy or some other stress going on with the placenta, then that can increase the innate steroid release from the babies and that itself could help mature the lungs. That isn't always the case though. The mother having chorioamnionitis, so having a bad infection, generally increases the whole overall inflammation in the baby and that would probably make RDS worse. So now let's talk about chest x-rays and general diagnosis of RDS. Like I already said, a lot of it is going to be a clinical diagnosis. So a premature baby um, who is born, especially if the mother didn't receive uh, steroids right before delivery. And the RDS can continue all the way up to the late preterm infants. In fact, the highest proportion of babies in America that suffer from RDS are late preterm infants between 34 and 37 weeks. And the reason for that is there are a lot more late preterm infants born than the micropremies. You can even have RDS in a 37, 38 weeker. That's especially true if the mother had sugar issues during the pregnancy. So if she had gestational diabetes, it's very possible that you end up with a 37, 38 weeker that has surfactant deficiency. So the first thing that you have to look at is the overall history. The second thing obviously is the physical exam. So like I already said, increased worker breathing. Maybe if the baby's already on CPAP or on the vent, they start requiring increased support. The third thing that you're gonna get is a gas. So I'm going to talk about this in a different video, but you're looking for the ventilation as well as the oxygenation. So is the baby getting the oxygen in? Is the baby being able to breathe out the CO2 that it needs to? If both of those are very off, then obviously we're a lot more worried about RDS. Ultimately though, you should be getting a chest x-ray. And there are three signs on the chest x-ray that would make it consistent with RDS. The first one is hypoinflation, so overall just collapse of the lungs. So the reason for that, like we already talked about, is that when you have a very high surface tension or you don't have surfactant in the alveoli, they're going to collapse much easier. And if you have enough collapse of enough alveoli, then you'll end up with atelectasis throughout the lungs. So you look at a chest x-ray and instead of being eight, nine ribs expanded, it could be six ribs expanded. So that would be very consistent with RDS. Remember that it is a less reliable marker when you're on the breathing machine. If you put a baby on a breathing machine and you pump up the PEEP to 10 and the PIP is at 30, then at that point you're probably going to be expanding the lungs. And so you're not going to expect hypoinflation on an x-ray like that. But that's the first one, hypoinflation. The second one is the overall just diffuse ground glass appearance. And what that refers to is just the overall haziness throughout the x-rays. And that, again, is consistent with areas of microatelectasis, so just areas of collapse all over the lungs. The third thing that you would expect to see are air bronchograms. And this is probably the most pathognomonic marker for RDS, which means that you see it, you're like, okay, that's probably RDS. And that is when you can literally see all the bronchi as well as the bronchioles throughout the lung field. So because of the haziness of the lungs themselves, you're able to trace the exact pattern 
of the bronchioles and bronchi in the lung field. And that is very consistent with RDS. So it's a constellation of all those symptoms and the chest x-ray which would make you more secure in making the diagnosis of RDS. And then let's talk about treatment. The best thing that's happened in neonatology in like the last 40 years is that they were able to extract the surfactant from cows as well as lambs and be able to administer that surfactant to premature infants. So just giving surfactant has greatly reduced the morbidity and the mortality of all NICU babies. So we do have surfactant available, both the natural surfactant from animals as well as an artificial surfactant, which so far has not been shown to be as effective as the natural surfactants. The way that we give the surfactant so far has been by intubating the baby. So we have to put a breathing tube down into the baby's trachea and then we will literally push in the surfactant and it looks like this kind of creamy white liquid and you give somewhere between 2.5 to 3 cc's per kilo of the baby depending on the type of surfactant brown that it is and you're literally pushing it into the baby's lungs and the baby, if they really do have a surfactant deficiency, will just soak it all up. And you can literally see the oxygen FiO2 that the baby needs go down from like 60% down to 30 or 25% just as you're administering the surfactant. The lungs just suck it up really nicely. What's interesting, and this is going to be a huge development in neonatology over the coming years, is there have been less invasive ways of delivering the surfactant which are in the process of being formed. So instead of actually having to intubate the kid, there's a way now of being able to just administer the surfactant more superficially or even aerosolize surfactant. So you're giving it just like a nebulizer treatment, just like albuterol or, or something else like that. So that's probably going to be developing in the next few years. For now though, the main way that we're giving surfactant is with intubation. The other big change in the treatment of RDS has just been the effective usage of the positive pressure ventilation. So now we have this whole gamut of mechanical support that we can give to babies to make sure that we're giving them the support they need while their lungs heal, while their lungs grow, and while they start making their own surfactant. So that goes all the way from just a nasal cannula, so a little bit of oxygen in the nose, to if they need a little bit more support, then we can give them CPAP, which is basically continuously giving them pressure um, to keep the alveoli open towards the end of expiration, to all the way to being put on a breathing machine, where the machines are literally breathing for the babies and pushing in a pip as well as keeping the lungs expanded at the end of the expiration cycle as well. So the ultimate treatment for RDS is just giving them the support that they need until their lungs heal themselves. I hope you learned something that was a very important topic in the NICU. So if you do have questions then please comment below otherwise please like and subscribe and thank you for watching.